get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. You know, resilience is one of the keys to success, and comedians understand this all too well. And today we have one of the top comedians, Joe List. You know, I emailed one of my favorite comedians, Noah Garden Schwartz, and asked him, who's a top comedian? I should be interviewing, and he says, Joe List, he's been on Letterman, he shot a half hour special for Comedy Central, he has a popular podcast, Tuesdays with Stories, and then I responded with, the real question is, is he as funny as you? And he said, he's funnier, and he's one of my favorite comics in the world. So, Joe, thank you so much for joining me. Wow, thank you, and thanks, thank you, Noah. Yeah. Forget you, thanks, Noah Gunch, for saying such wonderful things. <laughs> yeah, amazing, and you know, I always like to include a fun fact about someone, and you know, it's tough with you because you shed all, you know, someone yeah, but... can watch your funny stuff on YouTube and your site and Tuesdays with, with Stories, and you just tell it all, so one of the fun facts is you said you're riddled with sexually transmitted diseases. <laughs> I would say, well, I have two, two big so, ones. So tell me about that. I've had, I have one that doesn't go away, not the big one. Um, well, yeah, I have, I have, I have herpes, which I'm hope, I'm happy to talk about openly. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Which I think, which I think we we should, because I think like 25 percent of people have it. Yeah, and it's not as true. big a deal as uh, it really um, is made out to be. And yeah, like I had huge it, stigma, it, huge stigma. Bad, bad horrible stigma. So I'm trying to destigmatize. And uh, I, I've talked about it pretty openly since it happened because that's it was funny to me. Everything's just comedy, right? And uh, I've gotten a lot of emails from people being like, "Thank you for talking about this and stuff." So, and then I had HPV as well, but I believe that goes away after you have it taken care of and uh, minimize your uh, promis- <laughs> promiscuity. <laughs> um, so what so, happened yeah. with the herpes? Uh, well, that was uh, one I was. I was making love with a woman, and right before we started to, you know, have sex, she did. She was very sweet about it. She said, "Time out. I have to tell you this." Um, but the only part was tricky. Was we were already involved. You're like and, in and the middle. And yeah. out. So like we, we weren't having intercourse yet, but we were. I was. It was clear that that was what going to happen. So she could have said, you know, my vagina's a Venus flytrap. Like, I would have said, all right, well, whatever. <laughs> So uh, she told me, but she told me it was I was already pot committed. So uh, so what did she say? She's like, by the way, she was really sweet about it. I mean, she was like, she's like, I have, uh, I have, I have to let you know, I have herpes and I've had it for a while, and um, and neither one of us had a condom, you know, and I just was like, okay, well, whatever. I had been drinking at the time. I had a drinking problem. That's another fun fact. <laughs> Recovering alcoholic. See, I don't even know what to take literally, but I take everything literally. So I'm going to take everything you say literally. They're all it's all literal, but it's yeah. funny to me. So I'm laughing as I deliver it. Um, but anyways, um, so at the time I was drinking excessively, and then I uh, I got herpes on Christmas Eve. The gift that keeps giving. Oh, horrible. That's horrible, <laughs> Joe. Yeah, it was horrible, and also like at the time I was drinking excessively and wasn't taking care of myself, so I had like a really bad uh, attack or whatever you want to call it, outbreak. Um, so it was pretty horrific. But that was years ago, and I'm since uh, sober and I take care of myself, and it's not a problem. So Joe, you say you de- you know you try and destigmatize it because people think it's a bigger deal. So so what is it like? I mean, why why should people not be as worried or well, people should worry about I guess, I guess because it doesn't go away and it's oh. you know it's um it's a virus. It sucks. It sucks having it. And um but I feel like it's like a thing of like oh you're gross or it's somehow gross or or shameful. And uh really like one time I was with a woman and we were like going to hook up, we were making out or whatever and I was like I have herpes and she's like oh my god that's disgusting. And she really kind of turned on me. And I was like, "Well, you would have had it." Ten minutes from now, if I did the same, <laughs> so, like you're doing all the things it takes to get it. Right. Um, I'm just a person that cares about other people, 
so it's like it's it's and it's not it's when you have an outbreak it's pretty gross but um i think it's like a real a stigma i think especially for women more so probably yeah. um and i think it's a thing where, like why not just talk about it i don't care i mean right. some people think it's weird but i'm like well you don't have to have sex with me and um you know i have a girlfriend that i'm committed to so that that makes it easier because she does not have herpes i feel like i always feel the need to say that um we've protected her but um I always feel the need to uh, say that just in case we break up. I don't want people to think, like, oh, that girl's cute, but she's got herpes. <laughs> but anyways, I, I'm open to talking about it because I'm with her, and yeah. so it doesn't really matter anyways. Yeah. Because there's stuff you bring up, you know, in your – that's really deeply personal stuff, obviously. What is something in your set that you thought twice about because it was so personal? Um, nothing – too personal. I think twice about stuff like more like political mm. or like if the audience is going to get offended. Mm. Personal, I'll talk about whatever, but like I won't do it, you know, jokes about maybe race or politics mm -hmm. or you know, um, abortion or, or even STD. I don't talk about herpes in my act because people, because people do react like, oh, we don't want to hear about this. This is our night out. <laughs> um, whereas a, pod a podcast to me, they came to me. So you're getting whatever I'm going to say. Right. Like comedy, there is part of it that's like, well, this is your night out. And, Entertainment. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to. So that stuff, like, I don't like taking part really in, um, you know, political stuff on stage just because, well, first of all, I feel like I'm not smart enough to get into debate about a lot of that stuff. But mm -hmm. I just don't want to, I don't like offending people. It's not fun to me. Like mm -hmm. when people, oh, or, oh, or, or, you know, screw you or whatever. So that's not fun. So personally, I'll talk about whatever about me. Yeah. I but I think eventually that stuff may have to be curbed because now you have Twitter and stuff and people have access to you and people can tweet at you and just, you know, get to you and that can bother me. So Yeah, yeah. Do you, you know, one of the things in the intro that makes me think is, so how nervous were you before going on Letterman? Surprisingly, I get that question a lot. I actually had like this unbelievable... Uh, calm about Letterman. Hmm. Most of my anxiety, I do a lot of anxiety material, but most yeah. of it was years ago. I've really gotten a good hold on it, and a lot of that has to do with quitting drinking and getting sober. Hmm. Then I've gotten really into um, like Buddhism, and uh, specifically really? this guy Thich Nhat Hanh. I don't wow. know if you're familiar. No. He's, uh, um, the spelling is tricky, but he's a Buddhist, <laughs> uh, a Vietnamese Buddhist monk who just had some health issues recently, but um, he's a pretty amazing guy. He was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by Martin Luther King wow. uh, a long time ago, obviously. Um, and he's written about like 60 or 70 books. And uh, he's, he writes these really sort of practical, applicable um, books. And so it's really helped me a lot about being oh. in the moment and um, focusing on your breath and all that stuff. How did you get into that Buddhism though, in the first place? That was literally, I just, I, I've always wanted to because I've always been riddled with anxiety and yeah. saw these people that aren't anxious or like Eastern philosophy has always kind of fascinated me or whatever, but I was too busy drinking and trying to get laid to look into it at all. So then when I got sober, I kind of, um, just went to the bookstore and went to like the philosophy, you know, Eastern philosophy, religion section, and just saw a book called happiness. And it was by this guy, Thich Nhat Hanh. And I was mm. like, well, I would like to be happy. And I read it and that like blew my mind. I started reading mm. more and more of his books and I read some Alan Watts stuff, but, um, Thich Nhat Hanh is so much more like a, a applicable. I, I don't mm. know if that's the right word or um, applicable to you. Yeah, easier mm. to understand. I look smart. I have glasses, so I look smart. I'm not, um, but um, that's why I wear glasses. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You look like a <laughs> smart guy. But anyway, so uh, I, I just kind of randomly got into that, and uh, I had always done yoga, and uh, so I did yoga and started getting into meditation stuff. I'll have to check out Happiness. That sounds like a great uh, book. It is great. There's another one called Peace of Mind. That they're all very similar, but they're all really great. Yeah, it's, there's a funny part of your set where you do talk about anxiety and meditation, which I suggest anyone check out on YouTube because it, like, what you say makes perfect sense. Like, why if I have anxiety, would I want to sit in a room with my own thoughts? That doesn't make any <laughs> sense whatsoever. Yeah, it's funny because now I do actually meditate, but at for, like a lot of those jokes came from my initial thoughts of meditation or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or uh, Buddhism, but um, I always say I, it, it wouldn't be fair to say I'm a Buddhist, but Buddhism has 
changed you, my you life. Practice <laughs> Buddhism, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would like to be more so, I guess. But yeah. um, and Joe, so, yeah. I want to brush over too, like that you said you have a drinking problem and you sobered up. That's got to be tough to do, also. To, yeah, it was. To it was. That. It was tough, but um, you know, I had a lot of help, and uh, which is great. And my girlfriend uh, had been sober before me, so she was there. And a lot of my close friends have gone through it. There's so many comedians that are in recovery, so mm. that was really helpful. And also, I had been so unsuccessful and depressed with drinking that uh, it made it easier to be like, oh, I could feel good again. Because I didn't drink in high school. I never drank in high school until I was like 19. So I was like a happy, fun, party guy not mm -hmm. drinking. So mm -hmm. it, was, it sort of had that thing of like, I could just be like that again. Mm -hmm. So how miserable and unsuccessful I was when I was drinking really made it easier to quit drinking. Yeah. So I know you're from Boston. Tell uh, tell us a little bit about what was it like growing up there. Uh, well, I grew up south of like South Shore, south of Boston, in Whitman, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. about thirty five minutes south, and uh, it was great. It's I've heard so many people say this, but when you, growing up, you don't know anything else, so everything's normal. So right. to me, it was very um, normal or whatever. It was where I grew up was very very white, no diversity at all. I think we had you know one black kid who I was friends with. Uh, <laughs> We don't want to offend anyone say. in this one. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> so it's just a very uh, kind of like white Irish descent community, but it was the suburbs, definitely. Yeah. And um, you know, my family, my family was always together. My my mother has um, four brothers and sisters, and then they all have kids. Big and family. we would all be together every Sunday. Everyone lived together or lived close to by. So it was like a big family oriented thing, and mm -hmm. uh, that was all those kind of Boston things. Everyone was, we, you know. Everyone's insecure and thinks everyone else thinks that they're better than us. <laughs> There's a lot of that. My girlfriend thinks it's hilarious. What is there Mom, anything they, else they, that they, was they're better than us? Was there anything else that was abnormal? Looking like everything felt normal at the time, but looking back, does anything feel abnormal? Like was abnormal? No, I mean looking back, I think my dad is like a really, really quiet, shy guy that I never because he was just the normal. He was just my dad. Yeah. But looking back, he is like he is like I think crippling anxiety and insecurity. I think my mother does too. Hmm. So, you know, my dad was never like, a, let me teach you about this thing or that thing or like, this is how, this is some philosophy or politics or anything. We would play catch. He was always there for me. He was always at my games or anything, yeah. but not an open, talkative guy. And I think that probably made me seek approval from a lot of other hmm. uh, people and want attention, I guess. Yeah. What did your dad do? My dad oh, works yeah. uh, at a hospital. He is head of purchasing at a okay. hospital. So who were some of the comics that, or like from that age, did you know you wanted to do comedy? Definitely. Like when I was a kid, I feel like it always sounds made up or something when you're like, when I was eight, I saw George Carlin. But that's what happened. My, yeah. um, my uncle showed me uh, George Carlin. I think it was uh, Jammin' in New York or Doing It Again, one of those two specials, 1990. Mm-hmm. And it was on HBO, and I was eight, and I, I thought it was just mind blowing. I didn't get most of the jokes, but I just thought it was amazing. And then also, my uncle was older, so he was telling me it was amazing. So it was like one of those things where an older person is like, "This is great," so you're like, "It is great," um, which I think still happens in adulthood, by the way. Right, but, uh, oh, for sure, yeah. And um, also, it was on back then. It was on VH1 and A and E. Like it was comedy was always on, mm -hmm. and I remember. And this sounds made up too, but I remember like in elementary school or middle school watching like repeats of VH1 Spotlight in the morning, like while I was like eating my cereal before school. So I was like obsessed with stand up comedy. Yeah. And then Bill Cosby, who I know is like all this negativity now, but I can't change what influence he had on me. Right. But I remember watching Bill Cosby and being like, this is the most unbelievable thing I'd ever seen in my life. Yeah. Um, so that was like a huge influence. And I also have memories of like, Stand up was so big then in like the late eighties, early nineties. I remember my family had like a Friday night where they rented like a Louis Anderson tape. Mm. And that was the night. Everybody came over and they had like that Louis Anderson VHS on top of the VCR. Like it was waiting there while we ate dinner. Right. And then everyone finished the dinner and like got their wine. It was like, All right, we're we're putting it in and I was like eight or nine, so it was very like inspiring to me. Yeah. Um maybe not inspiring, but um 
uh, meaningful because and then everyone died laughing and then afterwards everyone would repeat all the jokes and go through and like what about that joke what about this bit and I don't know if people still do that but it was like really special it was yeah. a comedy special it was like a special thing yeah. that we did instead of going to the movies everyone would watch Louis Anderson or Gallagher was another one yeah so, so yeah when did you start uh, performing I started in October of 2000 so almost 15 years ago um I mean, would you do was, stuff at home for your family or or what? Uh... I, would, I had become like the funny guy in our family and I would tell stories and stuff. Like I remember my um, my cousin, Samantha, who was like eight or nine years younger than me. We were all sitting and no one was kind of, everyone was kind of like bombed or sitting. And my cousin Samantha turning and be like, Joe, say something funny. And everyone just laughed at that because I was like, what? I don't know. But I was like, four, so like when I was like 14 or 15, I think I started to become, and my whole family is funny, but I became like the funniest guy mm. I was sort of the comedian in the group i guess yeah and so um what so, were you like they, in high school in high school at first i was very shy i used to be like cripplingly shy and i yeah. still have some residual it seems like the that. opposite profession someone would get into if they have anxiety and they're shy well and they get into going on stage <laughs> you know well to me the shy and anxiety comes from not having control of the conversation of what is this other person going to say mm. And am I going to say the right thing? But with stand-up, you have complete control, and it's not really a dialogue. It's a dialogue in laughs and jokes, but I feel like I'm like, well, now I got, I'm got, i running the, the, the show here. Right, right. And so I think it's it's just a control uh, thing. That's where my anxiety comes from. Yeah. And um, so I think that, I think that so is it. So you I, did one of your first show, so you... You said you got started about 15 years ago. What were some of the first shows like that you did? The first shows I did were this open mic in Boston. It's not there anymore. It's called Chops Lounge. Mm -hmm. It was in this Howard Johnson's hotel right next to Fenway Park. And now it's been torn down. It's becoming, you know, it's such valuable real estate now. But it was like a shitty hotel. And it was the bar in the hotel. And um, I just was walking around. I saw a sign that said open mic, like a... um, what do you call that? Uh, billboard, not a billboard, but uh, marquee. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. It, yeah. said, it said Wednesday open mic with like those, you know, black letters. And so I was like, I gotta go. I gotta go do this. So I went there, and um, it was like the truest open mic. Ever. Like they would have like hobos on and crazy drug addicts and just maniacs, <laughs> and poets, and everyone would be going on. And so that was the first place I did stand up for the first like twenty or thirty times mm-hmm. I did it. Was just this wild, weird open mic. Yeah. And uh, but I remember the first one. It was hosted by this guy named Larry Lee Lewis, who's still around, and he would do old like vaudeville jokes and play piano. He was like a cross of Jerry Lee Lewis and uh, and Jerry Lewis, I guess. And um, he'd do like all these old jokes. And then I remember I had like a good set. I did like two minutes or three minutes, whatever it was. Maybe it was five minutes. At one point, I said, "Take my wife, please." And one of my jokes was, "I went to Cheers and nobody knew my name." That was like a big joke of mine. <laughs> And then another one I remember was I went to the uh, Celtics game, a lot of empty seats for a team called the Celtics. No, like, those were my jokes, but like it got some laughs because I was a kid and I was right. like a nerd. And I remember the guy Larry Lee Lewis gave me his card and he was like, "That was fantastic. You got to come back." And I remember thinking like, "I'm in show business. I did it. I've I've made it into show business." So, and, uh, what was like your first paying uh, set like? My first paid gig, I think, was at this place, the Emerald Isle, which is also not there anymore. And that was in Dorchester, Mass., which is like the only Irish bar in sort of like a bad neighborhood. And uh, my friend Ed Regal, who I'm still friends with, and he's still in comedy, he booked me and I think paid me like 50 bucks. But he hadn't told me he was going to pay me. It was just like a Saturday night Mm -hmm. show. And I did whatever jokes I had, and it went okay. And then afterwards, he handed me 50 bucks, and I tried to like give it back. You know, I was like 19. I was like, what? what are you doing? You don't have to give me money. I'm telling jokes. And he's like, I remember he said, he's like, you're going to be in comedy. Don't ever turn down money from anybody ever. Mm. Which I tell young people that sometimes. I'll try to give them gas money and they're like, no, no. And I'm like, if somebody offers you money, take the money. That's a good rule. This is a horrible business. This is not, you know, we're not, uh, whatever profession makes a lot of money. Knowing what you know now, would you have done the same thing? Or how would you do different things differently? I would do, I mean, so Because you've been much. doing this for a decade now. Yeah. Yeah, over a I decade. Would, I would do so much different because I, people told me, but I didn't listen because I was young. First of all, I started when I was 18, and when you're doing stand-up comedy, essentially you're running your own business. Yeah. 
you know, and your business is you. So 18 out of high school with no education is not really the best way to be running a business. You don't know what you're doing. You don't take it serious. And so I wasn't able to really discipline myself with work or writing mm -hmm. or recording sets or trying to promote. I, I did nothing. I mean, that's why I'm becoming successful now, 15 years in and not 10 years ago, whatever. And then I, I had a lot of, I had some talent and I was pretty good. So people would always say, you're going to be great. You're going to be big. And I would always go, great. Thanks. All right. So I, would, I wouldn't work any harder because I was 20 and good. So people kept saying, you're going to be great. And so I just kind of uh, ignored that. I drank way too much. I didn't really do, like I said, I didn't write very much. I didn't listen to sets. I didn't really try to get better. Um, so I would do, if I was starting over, I would do everything different. But where I am now, I'm glad I did everything the way I did because right. I'm a great. So what, what, do you, what do you do now based off of that? Like you said, the discipline, are you write, do you, what's your schedule like? Do you write at certain times? How does that work? I'm still trying to get better with that, but I do try to write every day or almost every day. I'm trying to have a I'm more conscious with, you know, Facebook and Twitter and having a social media presence. Um, the podcast is something I started after I kind of quit drinking. It was like, I got to start doing something. And so that's creative. Yeah. I'm working on writing some, you know, scripts or developing shows now. I do a lot more stand up writing. I get on stage a lot more, record sets, listen to sets to try to kind of figure out how to improve jokes and stuff like that. And then just general networking and sending out emails and, and whatever, trying to get booked and stuff. Yeah. And taking more serious, like a real job, like an yeah. adult. Yeah. Joe, what does a creative process look like when you sit down to write? Do you go to a certain place? Do you write in a certain notebook? What? Walk me through, uh, what do you do? I have a notebook. I write all, you know, freehand. Um, Stand-up I do. Like if I'm writing, like right now I'm trying to write a TV show and a movie. I do that on my computer, but... It's all notebook and um, or on my iPhone, like notes section. Yeah. But basically, you know, something will have to strike me and I'm like, that's really funny. That could be a bit. And then I'll sort of riff on and whatever it is and then my head just then what's funny about that and kind of get it all down. And then I'll go back later and try to adjust words or change sentences or flip it around. I, I do a lot of bouncing jokes off with friends, mm -hmm. uh, other comics. And then there's just a lot of just saying it on stage, recording it, and then listening to it. That, to me, is the best way, um, the most efficient way, is to kind of listen to where the laughs were. And also, when I'm listening to a set, I'm like, oh, there needs to be a laugh here. You can kind of make assignments for yeah. yourself. You're like, that's the spot where there should be a laugh. Yeah. What's the, so what are some of the secrets or ways to get a laugh? Well, Because you could do I it don't... right now on command, like, oh, I need to get a laugh here, and then you obviously do it. You know? Yeah, you got to try to figure out a joke. I mean, that's something I think that has come kind of natural to me or mm -hmm. kind of figured out. And then you do it so much that you kind of figure it out. But it's still not a perfect science because there's plenty of times where I'm like, I'll write something. I'm like, that's big. That's going to be a big one. And then it just gets nothing. Yeah, what was one like that where you're like, this is the funniest thing I've ever written down and it doesn't get anything. You hear this, crickets. This isn't recent, but this is one that really sticks out because me and my friend Tom always laugh about it. Right. But I had a joke years ago about how I got braces for Christmas, and that was a Christmas present, and that joke would work, it was funny, right. and then I came up with this line with my friend Tom, we were riffing, and I came up with this line where I was like, for my birthday, I got a tetanus shot, and we laughed so hard for so long, and I was like, that's an applause, I remember set, like standing up and being like, this is like 10 years ago, and I was like, that's an applause break every time, that's gonna kill, and it never got a laugh, ever, it just bought, like, I, didn't, I, don't, I still don't know why, People didn't think that was funny. I don't know if people don't get into tetanus shots or what. They don't associate it. <laughs> right. But to me, it was a perfect joke because, like, braces is so painful. Like, tetanus shot is such a great. It's the worst. Yeah. Like, to go with that. And it never worked. I, don't, I still don't know why. So. so, after you started, when do you feel you hit your first, like, big turning point in your career? I, for me, like, the first thing that felt like a turning point at the time, but I didn't really use the momentum. I opened for Dane Cook in hmm. 2004 nice. at um, the Cape Cod Melody Tent and then Hampton Beach Casino Ballroom, which are both like 2,500-seat venues. Huge, and yeah. This one, Dane hadn't blown up, blown up yet, but he was the biggest, like, he had just, he was selling out every seat at a club for a yeah. week. And I was doing these 2,500-seat theaters, and he was my favorite comic, and I just thought he was, like, incredible. And I got asked to open for him. And that sort of changed my, that made me at least 
with my ego or whatever was like, I am, every other thing else looks silly now after you've opened for Dane Cook yeah. in front of 2,500 people. So that gave me like a new confidence and I felt like now I'm somewhere. But again, because of drinking and ignorance, I didn't use any of that momentum to like get stronger or better. I just kind of was like, felt like I was somebody. But that definitely was like a moment where I felt like I'm a different comic now. I'm mm -hmm. better. How did you get that? That was, I worked at the Comedy Connection in Boston. It was like kind of my home club just from being around there. I started to open for these guys. And uh, they just kind of randomly asked if I wanted to open for Dane Cook. And I was like blown away. I mean, that was like the most, I remember the night before I didn't drink. I stayed home. I went to bed early. <laughs> I, was, like, I had to like prepare. It was like such a big event. Um, so yeah, it was just kind of, I just worked at the club and they were like, they were booking the opener and asked me. So what would you have done differently? I mean, like, does, is it typical for, let's say Dane's going on tour for you to always open for him or do they always want to bring new people on to open? Well, a lot of guys bring people, but he would bring other people, I think, that were friends of his. Like, I remember Dwayne Perkins opened for him for a long time and um, other guys. So I never, I don't know if I would have ever been his opener uh, or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. But I guess what I would have done, it just goes back, it's not even just directly related to opening for Dane. It was just, just generally. You didn't capitalize on it. Yeah, and I was, like I said, just, you know, drinking too much and uh, not writing enough. Just the same stuff I had talked about yeah. earlier, I guess. So what helps you? Is there anything that helps you get funny? Like some people will drink or some people will do drugs or is there anything in particular that you kind of go to that you feel helps you? Well, to me, I have to be happy and in a good mood because yeah. I, I think there's this stigma or... Um, rumor or whatever or, or idea that people uh like comedians are miserable and, and really um like struggling and um somehow miserable but i know very few comics that are able to write and be productive when they feel that way yeah. so i have to make sure i'm taking care of myself yeah and um and being healthy in order to be able to be funny that's when i'm funny is when i'm in a good mood and happy yeah. and hanging out with people and you know, kind of seeing things clearly and enjoying my life because I can go into dark places and then I'm not, there's nothing funny to me at all. Yeah, yeah. So I got to try to make sure I kind of, for me, like I'm working out and I'm conscious of my sobriety and, and meditating and spending time with people that I care about and feeling just generally healthy. Yeah. Um, What's fascinating to me about you and in comics in general is the resilience. Like, you know, just doing it day in, day out for a decade. I mean, it goes with any career, really. But, you know, I'm not in front of a hostile crowd or, you know, in general with my work. Like, I don't have people. Uh, so I'm curious, how do you, what's one of the most hostile crowds or maybe hecklers you had to deal with? Well, there's been a, a bunch. But um, I think, like, the most hostile and it almost feels weird using this example because it was so silly, but I opened for Bob Saget one time. Um, this is probably, I don't even know when this was, maybe 07, 08. Maybe it was 06. I don't even know, but it was 10 years ago. It was a long time ago, and I was open for Saget, and uh, it was at the University of New Hampshire, and I was driving in, and it was like February, so it was just freezing, and there was a huge line out the door mm. outside, and they're all bundled up, and everyone's freezing, and I was like, well, that's weird. And so then I came in, and it was like this, they showed me the room, and it's this huge gymnasium, and bleachers set up, and then chairs on the basketball floor, and it was massive. And I remember thinking, I should have brought my camera. This is going to be the greatest show ever. I should have taped this. And so then I kind of met Bob, and I was in the dressing room, and there's all this food and fruit, and they're like, the show's going to start late. There's a problem with the fire marshal, and so that's why everyone's outside. And so the show's starting an hour late, so I'm like, pissed oh, off. Uh, yeah, okay. great. I'm like, pissed yeah. off crowd. That's fantastic. Yeah, so I'm kind of like, okay, whatever. And so I'm hanging out with Saget or whatever. And then they're like, okay, the show's going to start. And I have to walk up to the second floor to where the show is. And I can feel the building literally shaking. And it's just like, <laughs> and I open the door and there's all 3,000 kids are stomping their feet and chanting Saget. And they're like, okay, so you're going to go on. I'm like, I'm going on right now. And the promoter guy who's running it goes on stage and he goes, are you ready for Bob Saget? And the place goes, ah! And they all go crazy and he goes well first it's joe list and immediately everyone is just booing everyone just goes crazy and they're Horrible. like boo and they're yelling and i came to them i sat at the mic for like a minute before i could even say anything because it was so loud God. and so i'm trying to do my act and just people are like 
you know, fuck you, you suck, and people are booing. I hope I can swear on this. Um, you could, yeah. So they're yelling, and and that was like the most hostile, I think. Yeah. But it was it was also weird. It was kind of funny to me because they just were college kids who hated that I wasn't Bob Saget. It wasn't right. like I had said something. Right, right. But still, so, you have to deal with the situation. So yeah. what do you do? I mean. I, it was one of those ones where I just had to go think about the money that I'm getting and that they don't actually hate me. Yeah. And so I would keep looking at my like phone and be like, okay, I got, I'm eight minutes in, I'm 10 minutes in. And at one point I got so mad, I just went, your hockey team sucks. And then they went crazy because they're obsessed with hockey up there. So <laughs> like, it, I'm just, just going to fuel to the fire with this. Yeah, and then some guy, they're all screaming out. And then one guy, I don't condone this language, but some guy yelled out, hey, faggot, bring out Saget, which is probably the most hostile uh you know, heckle I've ever received. And I was like, well, that's not really necessary or appropriate. And then I looked over and Saget and the guy that put the show together are both just laughing. I mean, Bob's just laughing. <laughs> and I was supposed to do, I think, 20 minutes. And it was at like 16. I was like, can I wrap up here? Can I get off? And they both gave me like the thumbs up, like, get up, get the hell out of there. <laughs> so uh, I was like, okay, thank you. And here's Bob Saget. And they went crazy. And Saget was like, that was hilarious. He loved it. He's like, that was hilarious. Um, so that was probably like the most hostile situation, I think. I love uh, that. Yeah. What's one of the favorite places you've performed? My favorite place to perform is definitely the Comedy Cellar uh, here in New York in the Village, which is like now the most famous comedy club and the best comedy club. Mm -hmm. That's definitely the best. It feels like home. It's kind of like family there. And they just have, it's always sold out and they're there to see comedy and they really police the room well. So there's never any problem it's like it's just it's magical right now we're in like a golden age of the comedy cellar so that's my favorite uh place i would say so how often do you do you go to uh, do uh the comedy cellar, i'm usually there about twice a week yeah. although lately it's been a little less because it, they just have so many comics and there's so many big famous comics that have been showing up there so like who uh, uh like the other day i was hanging out with john stewart and noah was there actually noah garden schwartz was with mm -hmm. me and uh, it was John Stewart and Louis C.K. were sitting there. We were all hanging out, chatting. It was really pretty cool. Yeah. And, um, yeah, those guys are just so enlightened and smart. And uh, it was great. It was really yeah. cool. So when you're sitting around with Louis C.K. and John Stewart, what, what are you talking about? What's the conversation like? They were talking a lot about social media and uh, sort of the dangers of social media and, and just people's cell phone addiction. They would talk about that a lot. Um, and then they were kind of telling old stories about comedy and the comedy cellar and stuff. And so, I mean, I was mostly quiet and just listening to these two guys go at it. Not go at it, but, uh, yeah, talk. I know what you mean. Yeah. And, uh, it was, you know, it was one of those things where I'm like, I'm, it was magical. I was proud to be part of this conversation. It was really neat. Um, so you, how often do you travel for, to do shows? Uh, quite a bit. I used to be on the road a little bit more, um, but usually about, I guess I would say like 30 weeks, 30 weekends a year, well, I'm, I, I go somewhere, uh, maybe a little bit more than that even, but yeah. I was so just listening a, that you were just in Ireland not too long ago? Yeah, I was in Ireland for a week, which was great. One of my favorite comedy experiences of my life. Really? Yeah, it was awesome. It was Is that random or what? why Ireland? Uh, it was weird. My old manager now lives in England. He's friends with this guy, Bren, who runs this big comedy festival in Dublin. And my manager was my old manager was talking to him. And so he's like, let's have him. They watched my Letterman. They liked it. And so he called me and was like, hey, do you want to come do this festival? And I said, yeah, I've always wanted to go to Ireland. It's like, it was pretty magical because Ireland's like my place where everyone's like, if you would ever could go anywhere right now, where would you go? And I was like, I'd like to go to Ireland. Wow. And I actually ended up getting paid to go there. That's, per is, that's perfect. It's pretty neat. Yeah. And um, so I went, and the money was great, and the hotel was great, and it was just, uh, it was unbelievable. The shows were awesome. How do you cater your material? Because you know you're going to Ireland, or do you just do the same stuff you do in New York? Yeah, it was pretty much the same. I didn't think about it too much. There was like a couple little things, but they they have so much American pop culture over there. Yeah, I did shows in Norway as well, and it was the same thing. Like They watch so much American TV. So, like, they know all this stuff. Like, they know about, you know, healthcare reform and all this stuff that we have over here. They're familiar right. with, even if they don't have it. But, um, so that was pretty. And then 
Boston is such like an Irish town. It just reminded me of Boston. It's very similar. It felt like uh, home. Yeah, that felt like a very similar vibe. And there was like little words that some people would use and they would like didn't quite know what they were talking about. But pretty much my act, I thought, translated pretty well um, in Ireland. Yeah. Yeah, because everyone, again, I encourage them to listen to your uh, Tuesdays with Stories because you tell just the funniest stories about the the fight that broke out that you are witnessing too. So people have to check that out. Yeah, it was insane, which I'm now doing as a bit. It's been killing. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, yeah, it was insane. So, Joel, you know, I was reading, looking through some of the social media stuff, and I'm just, I'm so curious how your mind works, like how you think of this stuff. Like one of the things I was looking at, you were talking about um, the sounds of high heels, and except if you turn around, you see, you know, see Ben Franklin. Like, how does your mind even go to that place? Well, that was the thing that really happened because, like, to me, I, I have all these jokes about high heel. I don't know what I have. I don't, somehow I have some weird high heel thing in my life, but uh, they're sexy. But this, that sound is so distinct of, like, of the heels clicking, and you're like, oh, it just sounds sexy. Like, it turned me on. Right. And then I turned around. It wasn't Ben Frank, but it was like a, you know, an, I don't want to be rude, but it was like an old, heavy woman. And I was like, oh, God, geez. And then to me, so then I'm like, that's a, that's a joke. That's a funny thing that just happened. And to me, the funniest example of hearing like heels clicking and turning around and having it not be sexual is so. a guy dressed as Ben Franklin, because <laughs> yeah. um, you know he wears heels. So that's pretty funny. Um, yeah, so that was kind of the process there. Like some of those jokes just kind of come and they're like quick and easy. Right. Know? So what was the next milestone? So you you opened for Dane Cook. Yeah, and then I think after that I moved to New York in '07. And then I got on Comedy Central's uh, Live at Gotham in 08, mm. early 08. And uh, that was like a big thing because it was TV. It was like my first TV credit. Yeah, it's huge, yeah. So that was like a thing of like, okay, now I've been on TV. Now so now when you're like, I do, I'm a comedian, people go, oh, what do you do? You do comedy? I've never, you can go, yeah, I was on Comedy Central. So that's right. like one of those things that's like, okay, great, I have a TV credit. And so that was like a big deal for me. How persistent do you have to be with that? To, to get on there that was like a, I got kind of lucky with that I did this um, comedy festival in Las Vegas it was like the HBO comedy festival and just I had a set and the woman that happened to book the show was there and saw me and she was like hey you should submit a tape she's like I love you you'd be perfect for the show send us a tape and so I sent her a tape and got on the show yeah and she was like great so she saw me live I and mean, that's always the easiest way is somebody sees you mm-hmm happens to be in the audience and just goes hey i like you put that on tape and send it to me I went, that's easy joe what's the toughest part about being a comedian there's a lot I, there's a lot of things that are tough i always say like staying mentally healthy i think which is such a generally hard thing for humans in this day and age i guess any day and age but right. it's hard to stay mentally healthy and there's no uh job security whatsoever and there's no definitive mat okay i work here for five years and then i'll get promoted to this right there's it's just a no clear path you just could be all over the board yeah Yeah. there's kind of nothing so it's it's interesting and then i look at like my calendar and i'm like well i have no income after february of next year it's just empty and people it's you kind of have to go it'll fill in right right but it's scary you know most people have jobs and not most people do have jobs. I mean, a lot of people don't have jobs at all. So I am grateful. But um, <laughs> right. most people don't have jobs. I mean, most people have jobs, and they, you know, if I if I get fired, I'll be owed a package, or I can click unemployment. I just kind of have to look and go, shit, I gotta figure something out here. Yeah. So it's scary to not have any literally zero job security, and it's scary also that I might not be able to come up with any more material. <laughs> like you have to kind of rely on you're funny and you can work and you'll figure it out, but. It's scary because you can have no work and then you can also possibly have no material, you know? That's so, maybe just you worrying, you know? Yeah, could, yeah. I mean, yeah, there are worries, but like neither one are technically guaranteed, though I'm confident I will be able to write material and get work, but <laughs> it's scary. But yeah, just staying mentally healthy and, and being able to remove yourself from the business. Because that's another hard thing about comedy, too, is you don't get to clock out or anything. You're always, you're kind of just your mind is working you have to be aware because anything could you know come up that you would include yeah so it's it's an interesting uh 
thing. But it's still seems like the best job to me. I'd rather yeah. be doing comedy yeah. than... Anything. When you first started, what were you thinking? This is going to be the pinnacle. And then what are you thinking now? Like, I want to... This is what I want to get to. It's weird. I've never been good at setting goals, which is mm-hmm. another thing that prevented me from being successful and I think is an important thing to do in comedy. And I guess mm-hmm. all... Uh, businesses or, or, or things to kind of have short-term goals and, and long-term goals. Because when I started, my only goal was I'll do comedy in Boston and then I'll move to New York and then I'll be on the road and I'll be a comedian. Yeah. And so I had this realization. Like, technically, I completed all of my goals. I was broke, right. but I did do comedy in Boston and New York and go on the road. Right. So that's when I started being like, all right, I want to do Letterman. Let me do Letterman and manage mm. to do that. It's like, yeah. I want to get a half hour on Comedy Central and now I've managed to do that. So... It's hard because you kind of have to keep, what do I want, yeah. you know? Um, right. So what about now? So now I, I want to, I would, my ultimate goal in comedy is to perform for people that came to see me as opposed to we're going to go see comedy and then I just happen to be the guy that's see. there. I'd like to have a room full of people that are like, let's go see Joe List tonight. It sounds like that's, that is happening though. It's happening to some extent, but now I go on the road and there'll be like seven people that came to see me. Um, and everyone else is happy that they saw me, but mm-hmm. they they don't know who I was before. But we're getting there. Hopefully, Last Comic Standing will help that in my half hour special in the podcast. When does so I want to do yeah. that? Go oh, ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. I'd like to do that. And th- now I've always wanted to be uh, Woody Allen as an artist, not whatever personal life he's done. Mm. But I want a career like that. And so I don't know if it's insecurity. I've never even written one movie. You know, I've never. <laughs> made a movie so I, lately i've been like well try to do that you tried doing stand-up and were able to do that so now i'm trying to write mm-hmm. um a movie and i'm going on some auditions to try to act and so i would like to be able to hmm. you know write a movie or sell a show and i i think it's an insecurity thing but i never really set higher goals than like let me just try to make a living right yeah so, I mean, sometimes it's a good thing. You just kind of take it in stride step by step and you're not like worrying about this big thing hanging overhead. When you're with, you know, John Stewart, Louis C.K. or, or anyone else who you really appreciate, um, do you, what kind of advice do you ask them? Um, I don't really, I didn't really ask any advice just because I don't want to, you know, bother them or whatever. I mean, whatever. what would you like, ask? I'm not saying like I, the conversation doesn't go that way because you're just chatting, but. Right. It's interesting now because there's so many podcasts are so big now that you can, and there's so many interviews because there's such a fascination with comedy, I feel like, that you can actually go and find Louis C.K., get advice from Louis via yeah. podcasts and stuff. Yeah. But I did ask Louis about, because um, this is something that in, affects my life, is like negative stuff on social media, yeah. like and hearing about that and how do you let, let it affect you. Yeah. And Louis, because he's good at that and he's famous, so he gets a lot of, you know, Hate. trolls yeah. and people just writing and he was like i don't let it bother he's like i can't he's like i can't live like that because he recently had the uh saturday night live monologue i don't know if you saw that i didn't he, see it no i saw him when he came to chicago i saw him live though yeah yeah but he did a thing on snl about how you know sex with a child must be the most unbelievable sex because these child monsters risk being ostracized and i'm not doing the joke justice but obviously it was like a huge controversy or whatever right. And so I asked him about that. I was like, so the next day, Sunday, you're making dinner for your kids, your lunch. I'm like, is it on your mind? Like, how much are you thinking about that? And he's like, zero, zero percent. I don't care. He's like, I did the joke and it's not my job. So that was like inspiring. And that's something I asked him to. Because that seems hard to do, though, like in reality, to put that out of your mind. Yeah, for sure. And he said he said he's gotten some tweets or messages that were like personal attacks on his life and how he wow. lives his life he said that bothers him yeah more than like hey that joke is offensive or whatever so people are actually a, like threaten you mean yeah i think people are like i don't know maybe they question of whether he's a good dad or something or whatever I, I didn't get too into it but yeah because it's a weird time now because somebody can just tweet at you and you read it like i had a guy tweet at me the other day and he was like you're a piece of shit and you're not funny and i was like <laughs> And it like hurts my feeling, and I'm like, why am I letting this guy hurt my feeling? He's this guy's. Yeah. I don't even know how you'd describe him, but right, yeah. So what else has been out there that gets to you a little bit? Well, like I shot my Comedy Central special, and at the end of it, it was like this big moment in my life, and 
it was great. My family was there, and I just felt like I accomplished something. And then I got back to my hotel room at the end of the night, and some guy tweeted at me and called me a homophobe and said I needed gay friends, which really bothered me because he's questioning my character. Right. And um, I have a joke where I talk about yoga, and I say, if you're not familiar with yoga, it's it's me two gay men and 25 of the hottest women I've ever seen. Right. I can't be horny, homophobic, and relaxed at the same time. <laughs> so technically, I mean, in his defense, I do say I'm homophobic in the joke. I mean, I've, he's the only person I've ever encountered that took that seriously and was offended by it. And I do have gay friends. I'm in show business and live in New York City. Um, so <laughs> it's silly to let it bother you, but yeah, it's it tough. does. It, it, a tweet is basically in the form of text. Some strange guy is... Yeah questioning my character but it's a thing i have to yeah not worry because it's going to come more and more the more success yeah. you have so it's an interesting thing that you have to uh deal with now yeah. is people are going to talk about you on social media when you but, say it out loud joe though it's really funny and i i forgot which talk show does this um or what late night show does it but they have the famous people on and have them reading like just a scathing tweet you know what i'm talking about maybe oh, jimmy I, I kimmel or Fallon something i don't that. What's oh, that? maybe it's Kimmel. It's Kimmel or Fallon. He it's like, a Jimmy. Had, like I remember seeing like Dikembe Mutombo or like reading yeah. like a tweet that just rips him to shreds, and it's it's right. funny like when he reads it out loud. Yeah, I love it. I love it. It's great, and it's it is funny because it hurts your feelings. Nice, tell people, and everyone just laughs. And, like some guy called you a piece of shit. A guy <laughs> called me a piece of shit in every way, <laughs> and you want to write back and be like, "Well, what's one way? What do you mean? <laughs> right, Not every right. way." And it's like, I'm like a really nice guy. I don't think I'm like, and that, that was a funny one too, because I was on vacation with my family. So I was hanging out with my nieces and I got like my four-year-old niece and my six-year-old niece and I'm like swinging them under my arm and throwing them in the ocean and like, and then I come home and it's just like, you're a piece of shit. And I'm like, I just brought so much joy to children all day. Um, it's just really, uh, oh, God. But that's what people are going to Yeah. That's but, really funny. Um, so what was, so so next, what was another big uh, milestone for you? I think for me, um, I quit drinking in 2000, the end of 2012. Mm -hmm. um, and then I kind of went and got, I started working at the Comedy Cellar. And that was like a big thing because I felt like, all right, I'm back in here. Now I'm in the best club. Yeah. And then like a year after that, a year and a half after that, I did Letterman. And that was like the mm. biggest thing it's huge, so far. Yeah. yeah, that was the biggest thing because that was like a dream since I was a kid. And I kind of never really thought, I never, it sounds so cheap, but like I never like dared to like dream of that. I was just yeah. like, that's not a thing I'll do. I can't do that. And then it was just a thing in like my sobriety and maybe Buddhism, I just kind of was like, well, why don't I just do that? I can do that. Why that wouldn't mindset, I be able to? That mindset. Yeah, you just have to kind of, I really think in life, I think you have to just, just it sounds trite maybe, but I'm like, you have to just decide to be successful. I yeah. think you can do that and just go I'm going to I can go do that thing and you have to just kind of work towards it and that, that was actually a long process Letterman it yeah took I was me about gonna a say year. how'd you finally get on yeah it took about a year to get on I went there with my friend Gary Gullman um, who was doing the show and I came along and then afterwards the bookers were there obviously the producers and they were and Gary was like you should you should know this guy he's great and they were like cool or whatever and they were like, send us your stuff. And then I sent him a tape. I think they just randomly were at the Comedy Cellar one night when I was there. Mm. And I had a great set. And they reached out and um, to my manager at the time and was like, hey, he had a great set. Get us the tape. And Letterman is like the toughest show with like standards and practices and stuff because really? I guess it's CBS. They had to keep tweaking and changing stuff. And they're like, take that joke out. You can't talk about McDonald's. You can't talk about this. Mm. So I had to keep changing sets and sending it back and forth over and over again. And then finally, I wasn't hearing from that. Then in the middle of my process, Dave announced that he was retiring. And I was like, oh, oh my God. Oh, jeez. You're like, this is the worst. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, this just unraveled. Like, forget it. And then we didn't hear from them for like two months. And my manager was like, I think it's time we move on. Like, because everyone's going to want to go do the show now because he's leaving. And all these people have to come on. All the big guys have to come on for the last time. And so um, she was like, I think we might have to move on and try Fallon. And I was like, well, just get them to say no. I want it in writing. I want mm -hmm. them to email me and say, we're sorry, yeah. no. And the next email I got was a date. Wow. And I was like, oh. And I was at Caroline's at the time, and I got a text from my manager that said, check your email. You have a Letterman date. And I That's just kind of like, 
for like five minutes and then opened the email and I just I couldn't believe it. And I was with a bunch of comics at the time and we all kind of celebrated. Went crazy. Yeah, it was really exciting. And then there's that moment of like, shit, now I have to go do this. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, that was like a big moment and a big day. My parents came down and uh, it was awesome. That's huge. So yeah, was, tell me about Last Comic Standing. So Last Comic Standing was interesting because I did Last Comic Standing in 2010, which was season seven. And um, it was right after this, I went through a big breakup. Like my, I live with my girlfriend and was in love with her and she moved away. She this moved was to in South New America. York? In New York. In New York, yeah. yeah. And she left me for South America. She was broke up with me. And I was like heartbroken. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. This is this girl's all I ever wanted, the whole thing. Well, and yeah. then Last Comic Standing uh, like came back for season seven. I auditioned for it, did well, and ended up advancing to the semifinals, which was out in L.A. Yeah. And I had this big moment where... Um, they announce your name. And they're like, the next comic going to Hollywood is Joe List. And they give you a little red ticket, which is fake. It's not a real plane ticket. Um, and I waved in the camera. And I said, I miss you, Becca. You know, because I was like, she's going to watch this in South America and come back. And it's this big moment. And so then I told everyone I know, I was like, I'm on Last Comic Standing. I made the semifinals. It's a huge deal. And then the show came out and they completely edited me out of the show. I was completely cut out. Really? Yeah. And it was like the most heartbreaking thing that I've ever experienced in comedy. Because I lost my girlfriend, but then I was like, well, forget her. I'm on Last Comic Standing now. I'll be famous. And all I ever wanted to be was a comedian anyway, so screw her. And then the show came out, and I was cut out of the show as well. So it was like this second horrible. breakup, and I, was, yeah. I lost things. And so uh, that was like horribly disappointing. And then uh, Last Comic Standing came back years later, last year, for season eight. And I didn't go out for it last year because I think I was still bitter or whatever. Right. You're like, screw them. I'm... Yeah. And then they came back again this year for season nine. And I was like, well, I got to make something happen in my career. So I went out and actually had a great experience this time. Mm. And um, as far as I know, I'm not getting edited out <laughs> this time. And um, so Do they to tell you when you're going to go live or when you're... Yeah, they emailed me actually. Yes, I don't know when your podcast will come out. Yeah. But they emailed me yesterday as we're recording this. That I will be on tonight. The night oh, tonight? Recording this, yeah. Oh, sweet. Yeah, so... I told uh, my wife to DVR Last Comic Standing, and so I better make sure she actually uh, did it, because yeah, well, I want to see you and Noah and and uh, see how it goes. Yeah, it went it went well, and uh, I'm not allowed to talk yeah. about it other, other than I'll be on tonight, and yeah. uh, I had a great experience. So, um, But yeah, it was one of those things where I was bitter about the getting cut off for a long time and then you start to realize well they're not it's not personal they are making a tv show and it's yeah. just that stuff happens you know so joe the previous years so what is the last the person who wins what happens i don't know exactly what well maybe i just gave away <laughs> that i don't win uh i think they get a quarter of a million dollars i think i think it's like hmm. two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and i believe it's a development deal with nbc and I get, it's like five hundred thousand dollars worth of uh, prizes, I believe. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a it's a chunk. It's a lot. Yeah. And then also you're just you know on TV a bunch. It's a lot of exposure. So the previous years are people well known because of it, or I think people have become well known. But yeah, I think a lot of people have become well known. I think Amy Schumer kind of started taking oh. off from that. That was like the jumping off point. My friend Tommy Jonigan has a I don't know if he's famous, but he has a really successful career mm -hmm. that kind of. Uh, started with Last Comic Standing in a lot of ways. It's such a huge show, you know, it's primetime network, so um, definitely it's a it's a big deal. A lot of people have had big careers from it. Yeah. So, you know, looking back, obviously, as a new comic, what would you tell a new comic to what mistakes to avoid when you're actually physically on the stage? You know, obviously, uh, there's a lot of mindset stuff and promotion right. and that kind of stuff. I just mean, like, the craft. I think on stage, I think a lot of comics... I think you have to really res respect the audience and understand that they're, and I struggle with this myself sometimes, that they are individual human beings that mm -hmm. have just are gathered in a group. Because I think a lot of times comics, we start to look as just, it's just a unit, it's just a thing of like, this crowd sucks, this crowd's <laughs> dumb, this crowd's great. Right. But you are speaking and communicating with individual human beings, and it is, right. it's a conversation in some ways in that you're you're talking to them, and so... yeah. 
uh, I think a lot of times comedians like to snap on stage or just be dismissive or, uh, you know, just kind of like, hey, fuck you. You get off your phone, you idiot. And I think you have to, I think people resent the audience in some ways sometimes. Mm. And I've been guilty of that myself. But I think it's a, a thing I would be like, you know, we're grateful that they're here. They could have done a lot of other things. Right. So, and they're real people you know? you're a true buddhist joe i think you're a well, true I, buddhist I, right now i try to be i try, I try to be, like they're just people and uh but I, yeah that, i say that but then i also you know snap at the bodega when my sandwich takes too long or whatever <laughs> i don't snap on uh, the snap in my head so, so one thing yeah. with the craft of comedy you'd say people just to think of people as individuals uh what else with the craft um i think a lot of people yeah, I, to focus on sort of um, material, I think, and, and writing and, and how a joke can be better or the best joke you can have. I think a lot of people, um, comedians, can sometimes waste sets by just kind of screwing around or whatever. And like, try, I think trying to get something out of each set and trying yeah. to get better each set, I would give that advice to people who are can starting you out. Talk to me about, because obviously you work hard and people don't see that. You know, they don't see the hours of writing and then refining and practicing you know they just see that final joke that you've refined can you right. give me let like, talk about the evolution of one of your jokes and like how it changed like what you had to cut out what you had to add it's funny uh, let me I, I try to think of an example but it's yeah. so funny because often i forget because once i finally have it mm. i've forgotten the progress i'm like i don't know how i that's so much of my material i'm like i have no idea how i got here right. but i'm glad it's working this way now um, I'll give so you an example from what I listened to for you, sure. um, where I noticed you use certain words and then you, one time you used another word. And so I thought, you know, okay, does he think this word's funny or like, I'm just curious of the thought process. And it was the one where you talk about your dad who said, if you eat meat, he'll put hair on your chest. And, yeah. um, and he's like, no, actually that puts plaque in my arteries or whatever. You know, one time you used the word plaque and one time you didn't. So I was, I like the joke and I like what you're talking about. And then it made me think of, hmm, I wonder why you used this word this time. And maybe you, it's oh. too, that's too, too much it thinking is, behind it. But. It might just be I hadn't told the joke in a while and mm -hmm. I forget how it goes or something. Or like I just forgot. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes you just kind of improvise a word on stage. You're like, oh, that was funnier than it was before. Mm-hmm. So I think, and that's part of listening to sets. You kind of like, why is this different than that? And this one seems to get a bigger laugh. So, um, yeah, I think there's kind of a lot of mixing and matching yeah. with words and stuff and just trying to figure out what can work the best. A lot of comedians are much like my friend Gary Gullman. He's much more of like a surgeon with that. And he'll try every mm. different sort of uh, different intervals or different words to put in there. I, if I get a big laugh, I'm like, that's it. Done. Shut it down. <laughs> that joke works. Um, so I don't. It's very rare that I'm I'm toying with a joke that already okay. works. Once I find it, I'm like, okay, good. Which is probably laziness, but uh, what's one lately like that that you're like, I've got it. Like you you finally got the laugh that you wanted. There was a joke, like a a real new joke. That's one of those things that just kind of happened. Was um, my girlfriend? I was talking to her, and I was like, I was like, do you think I'm hot? And she was like, Yeah, you're the sweetest. And I was like, Well, that's a joke. I was like, Those aren't synonyms. <laughs> and it took me a little while to. Just the, to have the word, those aren't synonyms, which gets a laugh. And I sometimes, and this is the thing about respecting the audience, I was like, I don't think the audience knows what a synonym is. So uh, that took a while. To <laughs> and then, but sometimes you get a lot of drunk idiots. So, uh, right. <laughs> and so then I added, that was like the thing that happened. Right. And so then I was like, I need more because that's just like a one line. And so then I added a part where I was, I was like, I know, but do you think I'm sexy? And then she was like, well, you're very punctual. Which that right. didn't happen. So that's an example of like a thing that happened. I was like, that's funny. And I'm like, let me make up a thing that's similar to that. Right, right. And then that was working. And then I was like, I feel like there could be one more laugh. And so then I added a third part where I said I was walking away and I was like, I might kill myself. And she was like, you had a good run. And I was like, well, that wasn't even a question. <laughs> and so that's like an example of like, so a conversation happened. I was like, that's a joke. And then I since have added two jokes. And now it feels, it feels done. But I'm like, maybe I could still come up with one more example like that. Which is funny, and here's another example. I tried adding to it again last night. I love hearing your thought process in this, by the way. Go, so go oh, ahead. Well, because I, I, I was like, maybe I can add this, and I was, I tried it this last night, and it bombed. I was like, I'm the opposite. My girlfriend will be like, hey, do you want to go visit my parents in October? And I'm like, I think you're so hot. Right. Which to me is funny, 
And it, last night it got zilch, so I'm like, maybe that's not funny. <laughs> so I might try it like a couple more right. times to see, but you know, maybe it's nothing. That's uh, funny. Yeah, I love that. I love hearing your thought process with that. And is there a certain time that you want to be like, okay, I'm gonna, I want this to be five minutes or ten minutes, or do you just worry about that later or keep adding jokes later? I never worry about time like that. I just want it to make sure I get everything that I can out of it because. It, it's so hard coming up with funny topics. So, and this is the thing that Gary Gullman has also taught me. Um, maybe you should be talking to Gary Gullman. <laughs> um, but he, like, it's so much hard to come up with premises. So you've got to try to pull everything you can out of each premise. So you want to make sure. And to me, I kind of have like an organic feel of like how a joke should. Sound. Like I'm like that joke just feels shorter than it should be. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And. So you have some like really long jokes and some that are short, but they just it feels like that's like that's how long that should be. You get a feel for it just because you've been doing it for so long. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, so Dane Cook, Bob Saget, Comedy Central, Letterman. Yeah. What uh, last comic standing? Yeah, but now I have last comic. I did the half hour special on Comedy Central, so yeah. it's kind of like a big year. It feels yeah. like. That's amazing. None of the things, none of the things have aired yet, so we're, we'll still. We, I'm still waiting to kind of see the residual. That effects. was in October, right? Last or yeah. uh, the Comedy Central. Yeah, that's yeah. October 24th. Yeah. So, who's your favorite comedians these days, and who's who's uh, people who you're like everyone will know this person someday? Like they're just amazing, and no one, you know, they haven't been in the public eye, I guess. Um, like my favorite comedian, like uh, Gary Goldman, is who I, I've mentioned now eight times. I just think he's the best. I mean, Louis C.K. is like probably my favorite. Louis C.K. and Brian Regan are two of my favorite comics mm -hmm. of all time um, and still both doing great work. Gary Gullman, to me, is a guy that is so unbelievable and doesn't get uh, talked about. Hmm. I think most comics and a lot of American things like Bill Burr and Louis C.K. as these two great comics, but to me, Gary Gullman is just unbelievable and um, as good as anybody. My friend Mark Norman, who... I do yeah. a podcast. With yeah, I want to hear about the Tuesdays with stories. Yeah, yeah. how that came I, I, about. He's a guy that I think everybody will know about just because he's so funny and works harder than anybody I know and is very driven and so talented. So um, yeah. he's definitely a guy that will uh, be known, I think. And yeah, he's my podcast partner. Um, How'd that come to be? The way the podcast happened was I had this idea – Years ago, from reading this book by of uh, Red Arbor. Tuesdays Arbar. with Maury. No, 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 oh, that book. Uh, we like... had no association with Tuesdays with Maury. Oh, okay. um, it's which is funny, uh, but I read this book called "Let Me Tell You a Story" by Red Arbach, the basketball guy, sure, yeah, uh, former Celtics coach, and sure. he had for years every week he would like they'd all go into Chinese. Him and all these former basketball guys, and they would just tell all these old basketball stories. Yeah, and I was like, I would love to do that with comedy and have every Tuesday uh, comedians get together and talk about their weekend. And the reason yeah. I thought Tuesday is because a lot of comedy clubs have Sunday shows, so people are traveling on Monday. Mm. So Tuesday we'll get together. And then I was like, it'll be Tuesdays with stories because it was the time Tuesdays with Maury. Right. And I never read like the book. I want to <laughs> do a, a spoof off of like someone who's dying. No, I'm just yeah, I, I didn't know anything about the book other than uh, it's a Mitch album book and right. it's called Tuesdays with Maury. And I was like, that's, I always wanted to do that, but it's so hard to organize comedians. It's a lot of work to get everyone together because yeah. they're busy and doing stuff. So then I was like, maybe it would work as a podcast. And then um, Mark is like the only person I could imagine being the other guy because we have a good rapport. Sorry, I'm just moving. Um, we have a good rapport and he's so funny. And we both kind of have an obsession with George and Jerry on Seinfeld, which if you've listened to the show, it has a... Uh, eerie uh similar sound to george and jerry having a discussion yeah. just a little more uh filthy and irreverent a lot of the times um so i just thought of him and the original <laughs> you've idea been so was, clean today joe yeah like uh, i listened to your show there and I'm like there's a lot of references <laughs> it's funny well it goes back to the audience thing because i'm like you know i don't know your audience so i'm trying to be respectful to whoever's listening but my my if you've come to my podcast you're getting whatever unfiltered the talk about yeah, yeah. um so, anyways, I thought Mark and Mark. Well, was and you just met me, you know, like you, yeah. you obviously know Mark, so. Yeah, we have a pretty good uh, rapport. We've been friends for years, but Mark was up for doing it, and the original idea was to have two or three comics on. It would be like kind of a roundtable of what have you been up to. Yeah. 
and then uh, slowly just kind of became Mark and I did a couple of on our own, and we, mm-hmm. which allowed us to kind of ha- riff and digress and do that sort of George and Jerry style of conversation that we both love and were kind of raised on. And so we do a lot of that, and um, you know, it's it can be pretty wild, and we, we just have fun, and it's. A lot of times we're just entertaining each other. I'm trying to make Mark laugh and right. vice versa, and which is dangerous because you forget that it's an audience. You get people being like, "You said this thing about that," and we'll get stuff about politics. And I'm like, I don't even watch the news. I don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm talking shit. I'm a comic, so go send your rage to these politicians <laughs> and uh, policy <laughs> um, What do you like about Mark's comedy? Uh, it's hilarious. I mean, he's just funny. Mark. I think a lot of people lose the funny or aren't. That fun, Mark is just such a funny person. He's so amazing at getting a laugh, yeah. and he knows how to do it. And uh, he really works a bit. I mean, he's a guy that really writes and gets in there. He's yeah. constantly writing. He thinks comedy. He loves comedy. Mark was a big uh, inspiration in my life because he's younger than me and reminded me, and he's newer at comedy, and he reminded me how much I love comedy because mm. I kind of got bitter and, and stale towards it and and I was like, oh, that used to be me. That's how I used to feel about comedy. And it really uh, reinvigorated me. Yeah. And, me. and it, he still does daily whenever I talk to him. So, uh, What's your favorite uh, piece of comedy or set that Mark does that you like? It's so funny you said it because I was just going to text him earlier because I was on Facebook. And he's got a great joke about ladies. He's like, just take all your swimsuit pictures and put them in an album. He's like, you know that's what we want. He's like, just have them. <laughs> so we find them. And he's like, they, women do social media like they do real life. He's like, if you want to see me you're like that, you got to meet my whole family. Uh, <laughs> I'm probably butchering the joke, but that's the idea. And that's like a joke. The, the, the test of a true joke, a great joke for comedians is like, I wish that was mine. I, I, God damn, mm-hmm, I wish that was mm-hmm. a joke. So uh, I love that joke. He's got a lot of other great ones. But I'm a fan of Mark's comedy. I love his comedy. But what he does off stage and on the podcast yeah. and just hanging out is like on another level. I mean, he is such like what? He's just such a funny person. Yeah. I can't even like think of example. He has so many. Th- he's just such a funny. Just in a normal conversation, you mean? He's just a truly funny guy. Nick DiPaolo is another guy like that. Who's another big, you know, influence in my life, and uh, I opened for him for years. Just those two people. I've never met anyone, or I can't, it's hard for me to comprehend how someone can be that funny. <laughs> Off stage, and again, I think they're both brilliant stand-ups on stage. But um, hanging out with them off stage is such a a thrill, one of the great thrills of my life to, to be around people that are that. Funny. That's got to be great. You're on a a show, or you're going to do one, and you're just sitting around with comics who the conversation has just got to be hilarious. Yeah, it's it is. It's great. I, it's it's hard because also the, the business is tough and there's a lot of bitterness and there's a lot of times like, I didn't get that, that's crazy, he got that and I didn't get that. Yeah. So you forget and it, it, it's good to come back and to just being silly and, and, and funny, um, which is another thing that you know Mark is great for. Mm-hmm. Um, What's been one of your favorite episodes of Tuesdays with Stories? It's hard to say because I, I never listen to them and I never really think about them again. We, it, It's very, Buddhist is very in the moment. We kind of yeah. do it and literally, they come out a week later, and someone will be like, that was hilarious when you said, uh, you know, rabbit fuzz. And I'm like, I don't even know what that's in reference to. I'll text Mark, and I'm like, do you know what this person's talking about? He's like, no. Right. And so it's hard, but like last week's episode, because it's fresh, was fun, because it was right. Dublin. And the Emerald there's been Isle, some, yeah. Yeah, there's been a few uh, episodes where I'm like, we end it, and I'm like, that was magical. That yeah. was like, great. Right. We really had riffing yeah. and... Uh, just to give you, know. you an example, like here are some of the titles, Joe, and, and yeah. for the audience, here are some of the titles. So we have oh, the boy. Emerald Isle title. We have Anal Ralph title. We have Kobe Cock title. We have okay. Forest Gumpshire title. We have Poppin' and Lockin', Sands, Sands and Cans. So th- that's a... Uh, yeah, it can it can get a little uh, irreverent, I guess I would say. And, so Kobe uh, Cock, what... What's with? Uh... I don't know. I think we were talking oh, okay. something about Kobe Bryant somehow, and uh, I can't remember. But I'm sure it was Kobe Bryant. <laughs> I can't imagine it. Maybe it was Kobe steak. I don't know. So what are you working on lately? What uh, jokes um, or now TV? just stand up as always? And then I'm trying to. I have like a like we were talking about herpes and HPV earlier. I'm trying to write a movie. I have a movie idea of like mm-hmm. a guy that has both those things happen. 
and kind of falls for the woman at the Planned Parenthood, Parenthood uh, clinic. Like I go there, which I, I by the way, I didn't know that. Um, I don't again. I don't want to stir up controversy, but Planned Parenthood, three percent of their business is abortions, and they do a whole bunch of other stuff, and they treat men as well. I went there for very cheap money and had my uh, HPV taken care of. So, uh, you know, that's my two cents. Why would that offend anyone, though? Well, Planned Parenthood is very. Uh, uh, what do you call it? What do you call that when it divides people? Uh, it just separates people, even. Yeah, like uh, when people, it's a controversial issue, what do you call it? Uh, I can't think of the word, I'm an idiot. I know what you're talking about, but I can't think of it either. Like so. People are either on one side or the right, other. Right, right, right. It's fighting, stigmatizing or something like that. Something. Yeah. Whatever. But um, but anyways, I went to Planned Parenthood to have my uh, HPV uh, taken care of, and the girl was like adorable and so sweet and so funny. I had a girlfriend at the time, but I liked the idea of like a, a romantic comedy where a guy has an STD and has to keep visiting this woman at a STD clinic and kind of falls for her. So I'm trying to write like a a bromantic comedy, I guess it right. would be. This guy is in love with this woman who's operating on his uh, penis. <laughs> um, so I'm working on that, and then I have a couple of TV show ideas and that I'm trying to kind of develop, and you know who knows what will come of them. And yeah, and then stand up is constant. I always am working on that. So, so what's uh, the thing you think you have to work on most with stand up? Stand up wise, because you've been doing it for so long, it feels like oh, I've done this, you know, probably second nature to you. Yeah, I, I guess I just want to keep coming up with more funny stuff. I really like telling jokes. I like telling jokes to people. As uh, Jay Leno said in the movie Comedian, it's fun to tell jokes. Tell someone a joke they haven't heard, you know. And so, to me, coming up with new material is just it's 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 so much of it's uh, like. Um, personal it's like selfish the happiest i am is when i can get a new joke working yeah. i feel so good and it's you know it sounds cliche but it's better than a drug or anything yeah and um so to me always wanting to have a new joke that is working it's so fun to tell a joke for a good crowd it's particularly a new joke and uh so i want more of that you know yeah yeah what i like about your comedy is um it's it makes perfect sense and that's why it's funny like one of the things you were talking about is um, with kids and you have this thing about um, why do we teach them animal noises? Because oh, yeah. I never, you know, I think you're going to affect my child's education. So this could turn out one of two ways. Like they, they skip curriculum of animal noises and they're better or they go back a grade because I never taught them animal noises. Right. Because right. it makes perfect sense. Like why are we teaching kids Animal noises. It's not so. I love that when you. Oh, you know, thanks. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a fascinating thing to me. I've never really understood. Um, I, but I think maybe at some point in time, years ago, it made sense. But do you find me. that you hang around with certain people because it inspires you more? Like, oh, I'm gonna hang around with my nephews and nieces because I always tend to get a lot of funny jokes. Or we, what do you tend to do for inspiration? I don't really consciously do that, but I guess there's times where I'm like, maybe I could get something like there have been times I have to say with like I've gotten jokes hanging with my nephew that I am like all right let me be on high alert here because something might uh strike me but I never really do that I'm just always kind of aware of you know living but that's how comedy is if something kind of pisses you off or makes you laugh either one could be like well that could I talk about this could this be something mm -hmm. um so I guess I'm just always aware of that yeah but I don't know how much I you know seek out things that right, might be right right so what's been um, one of the proudest moments, Joe? Um, I think Letterman was definitely a proud moment. My, like I said, my parents came. And mm. Letterman, to me, was a big thing in my life, not just comedy-wise, but I had kind of created this lovable loser thing for myself. I was like, I'm the, lo I'm the guy. You know, I got cut off the last comic standing. My girlfriend left me. I'm broke. I got... And I was just kind of this, like, I'm a nerd, and I never got laid. And Letterman was, like, the first time I felt like I, I had won. I was like, I'm going to win. You know, I felt like I'd try. I'm like, I could just be, that could, I could be a winner. I could be, like, a good guy. You know, like, I, 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 right. I could still be nice and be victorious. So that was definitely, like, a proud moment of, like, I did it, and I didn't, you know, uh, I did it without too, many, too much nerves or anything. I just kind of did it. But definitely, personally, like defeating panic disorder. I had panic attacks for a yeah. long time. Like kind of beating panic disorder and alcoholism to me, and staying on top That's of those wild. things 
which neither one ever go away. They're just, it's, it's funny, herpes too. I have three things that never go away. They just kind of live in you and you have to control. Like I hate herpes, to laugh at you saying that, but yeah, that's crazy. I try to make that a joke, but it's hard because anything herpes is involved in, people are like, ugh. Um, <laughs> and then alcohol, it's like, all right, that's too serious. Get out of here. But those three things, keeping on top of those three things and having them not affect my life daily is probably the proudest I've been of myself because it allows me to be like, I'm stronger than I thought I was yeah. or, or could be. So Yeah. So how do you beat or um, you know deal with panic disorder? Because that's, that's a tough thing too. Because you don't, I mean that you feel like you're about, you're going to die. Yeah. I, I haven't had one in like many, many years, like probably eight or nine years. But it's just a thing of like uh, you kind of recognize, you try to focus on your breath and understand that it's, you know, a thing. But and it, just try not to let it build up. I do a lot of like Thich Nhat Hanh exercises where I talk to myself and you kind of personalize your anxiety. Like it's a mm -hmm. thing that's inside of you and you're talking to it. Like right, I'm here right. to take care of you, um, which is a, a Thich Nhat Hanh thing of like treating almost like it's a child. Mm. Like if a baby is crying, as soon as you pick up the baby, it cries less it feels comforted right. and you kind of have to do that with anxiety of like i know you're here I, you exist and i'm here to uh comfort you and it, and it helps it may sound silly but um that sort of helps and now it's not even a thing i you don't even think about, about it. think about I mean, yeah. and, and alcohol is is similar that's a little bit closer to the surface than panic attacks but it's a thing of like it doesn't occur to me because i'm like I, I have it under control yeah for the today yeah uh, was there certain things that would set that off when you were having them? Uh, panic attacks? Yeah. All kinds of things. Sometimes they just started coming because a fear of a panic attack would, would start the ball rolling. Of like right. this, I would be like, this would be a bad place to have a panic attack. And that, <laughs> yeah, the worst and thing you could possibly take. think. Yeah, and yeah. they would just start building. And before leading up to Letterman, I kind of had that a few moments, which is what made it such a proud thing because I wasn't nervous at all. I shouldn't say at all, but... I really wasn't nervous at all. I was anxious and excited. Uh, yeah. But, but um, yeah, like I had that lead, that month from finding out I was going to do it. Yeah. There was like little moments. It was like, what if I had a panic attack before? And I had to be like, I can't come out. And Dave was sitting at his desk going, what do you mean he can't come out? So like that, I would have that for a few seconds yeah. and then just let it flow through me and, and float away and be like, that's not, yeah. not going to happen. Right. Uh, it's like you think of it and it's going to cause one. Right, right. But I was, you know, I've become stronger than it in that. Joe, what, um, who are some of your mentors? Uh, I would say, uh, boy, if I say it again, he's going to appear. But Gary Gullman, yeah. definitely. What's the best advice Gary's given you? Gary gave me the best advice I've ever gotten ever. And that was just, he's like, just don't worry about agents or management or anything. Just, just keep your head down for six months to a year and focus on what you can focus on and getting better and then see where you are after that. Mm -hmm. And he told me that, and in that time, I ended up started working at the Comedy Cellar and got Letterman and got a manager and an mm -hmm. agent. And so that was um, really, really great advice, and it, it always rings true. And that's, for any, I think, business, is just control what you can control and everything else is, yeah. you can't do anything. So that was um, definitely the best advice. He's Ooh. a big mentor, and Nick DePaul, yeah. Colin Quinn is another one who I'm yeah. close with, and he's definitely uh, extremely meaningful in my life. What did he? Uh, what advice did he give you? Um, he's given me a lot. He gives me a lot of advice of like, I'll be complaining about comedy and the business and how it's not fair and this. And he's like, that's all jobs, and that's right. everywhere. Everyone thinks that they should be doing something. He's like, that's not unique to you. Right. Colin is good at letting you know that none of this is unique to you. Putting not, in perspective, not to dismiss your problem. But yeah. yeah, he also has a thing where he says, "All right, whatever you're bummed about." Go take a walk and think about it until you see the first guy you see in a wheelchair with no legs. Right. And then worry about how few sets you've got at Stand Up New York or whatever. And he's really it's good, a good uh, perspective, yeah. at that sort of thing of like, I'm, I'm telling jokes for a living. Like, just right. relax. It's fine. <laughs> um, like, you just made me feel like a horrible person. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, but it's good. I mean, he's good with that kind of thing. He's also very loving and warm as well. Yeah. Um, he's not just like, you know. Fuck you, you no, know. it is a good perspective, though. Yeah, yeah, it, it really is. So uh, he's really helpful with that, and um, just he, another guy is so enlightened and so much wisdom that it, it's it's comforting. Just he's a guy; it's just comforting to speak to 
for five minutes about nothing. You're just like, oh god, I, that guy's in my life. That's good. Mm-hmm. And then Nick DiPaolo, what you obviously respect respect him a lot. Yeah, well, Nick, I opened for Nick for years on the road. We became friends, and I, I worked with him for a lot. And he's has a very like fatherly figure in my life. Um, like I said, as my dad's like a really quiet guy, I think I've kind of seeked out additional father figures, and he was sort of one of them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he's just. Uh, one of the funniest people I know, but a constant friend and uh, is a guy that's like, I'm, I'm proud of you. He was at my Letterman and stuff like that. So Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm curiously curious. Um, can you walk me through what's a typical day of a comic? Um, you wake up well, when? You go to sleep when? I'm pretty good. Like a lot of comedians will sleep a lot later than I am because mm. I don't drink anymore or whatever. And I don't go out and get laid because I have my girlfriend. I mean, I get laid via my girlfriend. <laughs> uh, we have a wonderful sexual relationship. But uh, I usually wake up around um, like 10. I wake up around 10-ish, 10. Yeah. I'm a 10 a.m. kind of guy. Okay. And um, I'll go to the gym. And then um, I'll kind of try to hang with my girlfriend a little bit, write some jokes. I'll try to write, listen to a set. I do a lot of podcasting because I have my podcast. I'm also a regular on Robert Kelly's podcast. And then yeah, you're you kinda, a number of them, yeah. Yeah, so you kind of just end up being guests on other podcasts. I try to make sure I do things for myself. I go to the movies a lot. I have a movie obsession. Oh, nice. Favorite but, movies? What are, what are some of those? Um, Forrest Gump, Goodfellas, No yeah. Country for Old Men. Yeah. Um, those are my probably my What about top comedy? Three. Favorite comedy movie? Uh, Dumb and Dumber. I love this. Is Spinal Tap is probably my favorite comedy. The Naked Gun. I love Dumb and Dumber. Yeah, phenomenal. Yeah. The Cable Guy. I love. I was a big Jim Carrey guy. Um, so you uh, go to the movies sometimes. I go. What? I go all the time. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, and then yeah, just a lot of. You know, I talk to my mother every day. It's it's funny because like with stand up. I feel like you can put like two hours of work in and you're working harder than almost every other comedian. It's really, that's one of the nice things. Um, so I try to put a couple hours of, of writing and then there's a lot of constant emailing and stuff. Um, emailing Facebook and trying to book shows and stuff like that. Yeah. And then uh, evening, you're probably going to the, one of the you know, performing, right? Yeah, I'm going to do sets. I usually do two or three sets a night in New York and... Um, and then try to just come home and I, I, there's a steam room in my gym. I like to steam. I steam every day. It keeps me on an even keel. That helps with my anxiety. And try to spend some time with my girlfriend and um, and try to spend time with friends, hang out with comics and stuff. Because sometimes you were saying that you may have to drive all over town for a couple. It's not like you just do back-to-back at the same venue, right? You, you could go to one place and then another place. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of running around. I mean, I used to have a car, but now it's all train, which is, you know, fun. But some people like to, like Mark Norman is an example of a guy. He likes to do five, six sets a night and mm. really run around. I'm a little more, I like to do two or three, and I like time in between because my anxiety kicks up from running from one set to the other. Yeah. And I can be late and stuff, so. What uh, are other people most jealous of you because you're a, a comic with your schedule? I think the schedule probably, I think that people think, like my family stuff, think that I don't work and have this kind of easy life, but um, it is stressful. There's a lot of mental stress, yeah. and um, like I said, there's no job security, and also I think it is uh, a, a relatively rare and kind of special skill, you know what I mean? Like I think, you know, I could probably fix a car if I spent some time <laughs> learning on it, but... Um, <laughs> There's not – most people can't just learn how to make a room full of people laugh. Right. So that well, that was some family bitterness that just came out there. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think people are jealous of the, the schedule or, or whatever that I, I don't really have to be – I'm an incredibly grateful and fortunate human being. I don't really have a lot of places I have to be, especially during the day, you know? Mm-hmm. Like this – Podcast, this is a big deal. I was like, oh boy, one thirty. I gotta be one thirty-three. <laughs> I mean, this is like this is the big thing in my schedule. Today, Amen. Me too. Is, uh, chatting about myself. So, Me too. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really good life, and I'm, I'm, it doesn't. Um, it's, I'm not. It's not lost on me how uh, grateful I am to just kind of work. Working hard to me is writing for an hour and a half. You know, it's yeah. I'm not building anything. I, and I think that all the time when I see like guys. 
roofing or construction work and it's 110 degrees, I'm like, I'm really glad that I'm able to do this for a living and live in a country where it's a thing and have right. some of talent. Right. Uh, and parents that were supportive and allowed me to be like, I'm going to try to do this. Yeah. yeah. What did your parents say when you you get out of high school and you're like, I'm going to do this comedy thing? They were unbelievably supportive and continue to be always have been. They were very financially supportive in spite of being not financially well off by any means. Um, and so they were, they were great. You know, I think they weren't necessarily thrilled, but my mother was, my dad, like I said, my dad's quiet, but my mother was like, okay, okay whatever you're going to do. Unbelievably supportive. Um, yeah. And uh, they come to shows all the time and they always have. And yeah, uh, yeah they're, they're the best. And um, So how I, hard is it to make your dad laugh? Because it sounds like he's pretty quiet and stoic. No, he's a big laugher. Like he is laughs it? a lot. Yeah, okay. he's a funny guy. He's just a quiet guy. I think yeah. it's very Irish. Like it's like Irish Catholic uh, thing. He's just a very yes stoic. Even sounds weird. I think he's just shy. He's, I think he's a really quiet. shy, yeah. quiet guy. Yeah, I, you know, he loves me and he laughs. Like he's a he's a great laugher. You know, yeah. and uh, when he does talk, he was, he's a funny guy. So, um, what's his favorite? Does he? What's his favorite uh, joke or set that you do? See, he would never say. I, I he wouldn't no say. <laughs> we have to ask him. Yeah, I, I usually talk. I ask my mother and and hear through him. What did I'm she like, say? What did Dad think about yeah. this? You know, she's like, I think he was happy, but she she struggles with it too. You know, um, she's like, yeah, it's tough. He doesn't say much. Um, he's. I think he's just a. That's just who he is. You know. Yeah. Um, his family was like that too. His father was super quiet, and so was his mother. So it's just, I think it's all, I don't know, Boston Irish, I think. Right. So, Joe, where should we point? I have one last question. I really appreciate your time. Um, yeah. And I especially appreciated uh, researching you and just watching all your, your sets online. Oh, thank you. Um, where should we point people towards? I know there's Tuesdays with Stories site, uh, .com. Where else should people check you out? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Joe List Comedy. Mm -hmm. I prefer to keep it positive. Uh, I have feelings. I'm a human being. Yes. Um, at Joe List Comedy, and then Instagram. If you're on Instagram, I, I love I love Instagram. Really? I have some really great pictures on there. I'm uh, I have an award winning Instagram account. Seriously? Yeah, Joe List Comedy. What got you to Instagram? That seems random. Well, I love photo. I've always been obsessed with photography and loved it. And um, you know, a real photographer might be annoyed by me because I'm taking pictures on my iPhone and adding filters to them. But I do love uh, photography, and I I do enjoy doing it. And so, yeah. a lot of there's a lot of like jokes on there as well, and, like silly things. But a lot of them are pictures I'm like really proud of. I think are good pictures. Yeah. Um, so you can see me on uh, Twitter, Instagram, and then like you said, my podcast, and then my uh, Comedy Central special is on October 24th. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. So. We've talked a lot about a lot of different things. Joe, what um, what story should we leave people with? Oh, geez. Yeah. Um, boy, that, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Throughout uh, your, you know, when you look back, what's what's one of your favorite stories from either one of your sets or traveling or, you know, one of those things that just sticks out to you in your comedy career? Oh, man. Now I feel... Uh, pressure i'm trying to think of a good story oh man i feel like i was so i did so well until right now um it's just uh just like you said it's just us two with the conversation <laughs> so um see I, I love stories and i'm always obsessed with them, but then i'm like i always forget that i forget so what much about stuff. one lately that right. you've been obsessing on or writing well there's the fight i mean the dublin fight story i can tell that one because that was pretty insane um, I, I told on my podcast, but I'm happy to tell it here. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, that is in, insane. It was really wild, and it's now a bit, and it's so it's definitely the story that's most uh, prevalent in my life. But my, my friend Michelle Wolf, who's another great comedian, we were visiting this bar in the afternoon because there was a guy playing music. You know, Michelle had a beer, and I was watching the music, and we walked out. And as we're walking out, there's just a huge street brawl between these two bouncers at one bar from a bar, and this other guy who's like the quintessential not to be racist, but like the Irish hooligan, like the white tracksuit and shaved head. And um, and they're fighting and they're rolling in the streets. It's like the craziest fight I've ever seen. It's like a six-minute brawl, which wow. most fights are like 30 seconds long. Right. And they just right. keep going. And at one point, the guy in the tracksuit is on one knee just like taking a blow, like a, like a, like a, like halftime at a game. Like he's just like, 
taking a breather, <laughs> and the other two guys are just standing there, kind of over him, and then he kind of finishes and gets up, and they start fighting again. And then at one point, they knock him down, he's laying on the ground, and they don't hit him while he's down, and I really thought, like, what a commendable thing to not hit a guy while he's down. These are, like, gentlemen, and then the guy's girlfriend came running over, and I should mention the guy in the tracksuit and his girlfriend, are on, they're on methamphetamine. There's oh. a meth there. So the woman comes running over, and she's like, ah! And one of the bouncers just punches her in the face as hard as I've ever seen anyone punch. And I've never seen a woman punched in the face before. Because in America, we either don't do that or evidently it's, you know, behind closed doors. Uh, <laughs> right. I've never seen it. I've never heard of it happening. Punched her in the face. She didn't even go down. She was just like, ah, and starts screaming. And I was like, well, I have to reassess my feelings on this guy. Because a minute ago, I was like, what a gentleman. He won't hit a man when he's down, but he will hit a woman when he he's just up. just punched her in She's the up. face. Yeah. So uh, that happened. So then the guy... The guy in the tracksuit gets up, he grabs a chair, and then he hits one of the guys with a chair, which I've never seen in real life. Only in WWE it, or something. Ex yeah. Exactly. So he goes to hit him a second time, and the other bouncer rips the chair out of his hand, and then the guy in the tracksuit's like, has this moment where he's like, forget the chairs. I don't know what I was thinking with the chair. I don't <laughs> want to do chairs. And then that whole thing happens. They end up losing the fight, and the woman yells out, all I wanted was some chips, which... <laughs> is the craziest thing and we were both just like what the hell happened that in this woman's mind she ordered chips and now she's in a bench clearing brawl oh my chip. god that's funny and then the guy pointed at me and was like call an ambulance and i had to be like well i'm actually visiting from america so i don't have a phone but if i could get wi-fi i could text <laughs> i could just text somebody that has like an iphone also. oh my god um so that's like definitely the most recent and that's funny. wildest story I like. I didn't see when I listened to the part of it. I didn't hear the chips part of it. So oh, yeah. that makes it, was, it uh, even better. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. And chips in Ireland are French fries, so it's right. a little more understandable. Those are delicious. A little chips. bit more, yes. Um, so yeah, that was a recent one. It's pretty crazy. Joe, thank you so much. People need to check out you on YouTube on your podcast and um, the Ultimate War Warrior and everything yes, else. Please. So I just want to be the first one. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate it. It was fun. Yeah. Thanks for having me. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.